Hello there and welcome to Revive Church, our online service. It is so good to have you with us today. And we really hope that the service blesses you, finds you exactly where you are, encourages you and ultimately leads you closer to Jesus. Our vision here at Revive Church is to help people find life and purpose through Jesus. And we really hope that today that can happen for you. My name is Phil and it's a great honor to invite you and to welcome you to church today. Uh, I really just want to be able to connect you with the next step. And if there's anything you'd like to know about Revive Church, uh, maybe getting connected to our church, finding out a bit more about us or our leadership, I'd love to direct you to our website, which is www.revivechurch.co.za. On the website, you can connect yourself to a next step. You can fill in our online connection card where we can reach out to you find out a bit more about you and even if you'd like to give today uh, towards our church and towards what God is doing through our church you are welcome to do that on the website well we're about to hear a message from uh, Roxy Evans we really hope that you enjoy it lean in take some notes and we'll see you soon thank you Swin I thought I was going to have to wrench that out of your hand. <laughs> jokes. <laughs> Only joking. I just needed to make a little jokes to break the ice. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Um, it's such an honor to be here again this morning. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Roxy Evans. And yeah, I just want to say thank you so much to Swen and to Lara for giving me this opportunity to share. I really do feel like God has put a message on my heart today. So very excited a little bit nervous haven't had a lot of sleep but it's good because it's not about me it's about jesus we're going to give him all the glory today the worship was insanely amazing and powerful and i mean there's nothing better than being in god's house right awesome okay so um yeah so when swen said that i was going to be speaking today and sarah's speaking this evening so double dip it's going to be amazing. Um, he was like, just speak on whatever's on your heart, whatever you've been experiencing. And I was like, well, that's very brave. <laughs> <laughs> Giving me a mic for 30 minutes, I could go on a tangent. But I knew exactly what God wanted me to speak on, and that was faith. So <laughs> my journey with faith, goodness me. Faith is actually one of my gifts. It's, it's something that I've always had. God gave me faith. He gave me this strong faith in him and in who he is. Um, it's one of my gifts, like I said, and it's something I uh, am proud to say that God has given me to use for his glory. But <laughs> this year, I've really felt challenged in my faith. I have had these moments throughout the year, and I know it's what happens when we're tired and we're busy and we burn out, but Jesus not Jesus, <laughs> the enemy has really been testing my faith. He's been planting little seeds of doubt in my mind and in my heart, these little whisperings, you know, this little questioning, like, is Jesus who he says he is? Are you actually called? And I've just been like tackling it and like, no, head down, I'm, I'm going to power through, I'm going to persevere, but it's still there. It's, it just sits inside my heart and it's the enemy's way of planting a seed, a seed that can grow and that can cause me to go off path. It can cause my faith to waver. So I knew, I knew that today God wanted me to speak on faith. This is something that he has taken me through, but God turns all things to the good of those who love God. So if I persevere and if I'm resilient to my faith, it's going to make me stronger. The enemy won't win this battle. <laughs> so this is my challenge, and this is what I knew God wanted me to speak on. But during the season of feeling so challenged in my faith, um, it felt lukewarm. You know, it's a, it, I had a faith that didn't actually affect the way I lived. That's lukewarm Christianity. I had a faith that uh, where I didn't actually need Jesus. It was a faith in name and not in action. Can any of us attest to that? It's a, it's a lukewarm faith. And in Revelations, it says that Jesus wants to spit you out of his mouth if that's the faith that you have. It's lukewarm water. It's, it's detestable which shook me to my core because we think, oh, I, I believe in Jesus, but do I need him? Do I live for him? Do I allow my faith in him to impact my life? If not, it's lukewarm Christianity. So that shook me. And so, like I said, praying into today's message, I knew God wanted me to speak on faith. And so the message, the, the topic, the title of my message today is Resilient Faith. Resilient faith. Because I know 
and I'm praying and I'm hoping that this is going to speak to a lot of us today because I know that people in our church are going through a very challenging season. I know that people in our church have experienced massive loss over the last year alone. I know that people are experiencing a lot of change. And for those of us who don't like change, this shakes us. So I'm really praying and trusting God that this message today is really going to impact our lives and build resilient faith within us. So can we pray? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you so much for this message. I thank you so much that everything that we need is in you. I thank you that you are faithful, that your promises will never fail, that you are always with us. Lord, I thank you that in you we can have resilient faith. And today, God, I pray for every single one of us that we will grow in faith from hearing your message today, Lord. I pray that we will leave here changed by your promises, by your truth, by your presence, by your word, and by your truth. Father God, we just commit this service to you. I pray that you'll anoint every single word that comes out of my mouth, and may it not return void. I pray this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. 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 I'm just going to have a sip now. I'll leave that open so it's not such a long, <laughs> awkward pause next time. But, um, okay, so I'm going to read something. So this had like a little bit, a little part to play in my journey of questioning faith and being tired and being busy and being burnt out. This is what our year has felt like this year. So if you can relate, feel free to shout out an amen. Oh my gosh, yes, that's me. Yes, yes, yes. Put your hand up just like hallelujah. That, not hallelujah because it's crazy, but you know, one of those. So this is what our, our year has felt like. Okay, I'm going to read it because it's a little bit all crazy. Early morning school runs, work, school pickups, extra murals, anxiety workshops, grocery shopping, nagging for treats, sibling spats, prepping for orals, broken bowls, broken lights, cooking, supper, <laughs> meetings, bath, bed, A-type moms, planning breakup day six weeks in advance. Like, praise Jesus for you. <laughs> but it just adds to my crazy. Play dates, play dates, more play dates. Life groups, problem solving, geezers, bursting painters, running Airbnbs, COVID, swine flu, adenovirus. Anyone want to say? <laughs> 2022, what? And then waking up on Friday feeling frazzled. <laughs> and then the realization that it's Christmas in eight weeks' time. <laughs> Really? Does, <laughs> yeah. Does anyone else go, I'm sorry, what now? Yeah. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> where's 2022 and where's the abundant life Jesus promised I would have? <laughs> Is this it? Oh. John 10 verse 10 says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Yeah. I want abundant life. <laughs> I want abundant joy. I want abundant peace. I want abundant quality time with my family. I want abundant finances. I can bless everyone. And I want abundant everything. <laughs> I want what God promised. And uh, we uh, went on our first holiday of the year, thanks to COVID, adenovirus, swine flu, all the rest, broken whatevers. Our first holiday of the year in September, the September school holidays. And I'm not going to give away where we went, just in case next time I go, I see all your faces. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Jokes. Um, but I, we were like, we were holding on to this holiday. We were like, thank you, Jesus, it's coming, that abundant life. It's there. It's just five weeks away. And we were counting down, all four of us. We were so excited. We were like, five weeks, just four weeks, just three weeks, just five days. Guys, it's five days. It's around the corner. It's almost here. And we were like holding on to this abundant joy we were going to have, abundant peace, abundant rest, abundant fun, quality time, all of the above, and I felt God really asked me to check my heart, and he was like, why are you idolizing this holiday? It's not going to give you what you need. It's not going to give your soul the refreshing that you need. Sure, it's beautiful. You're going to have fun. You're going to have a great time, rest, but it's not going to refresh your soul. Refresh you physically, perhaps mentally, perhaps it's not going to refresh your soul. I'm so glad that he did, that he prepped me in advance, because it was stunning. We had an amazing time. We had loads of fun, loads of quality time. But it was coupled with tragedy and real life. 
And if I hadn't been prepared by God beforehand and reminded what I was actually placing on this holiday, I would have been really disappointed. And coming off the back of Phil's brilliant message from last week, he says that unmet expectation leads to disappointment. And that's an easy, slippery slope for the enemy to get in there. And like Swain said, rob your praise of God. You start to question, where's God? I've worked so hard this year. I've waited so long for this holiday. It seems so small and insignificant. But the enemy will take any opportunity he can to rob you of praising God, rob you of having faith in God, rob you of your hope in God. Because the first part of John 10 verse 10 says, the thief comes only to steal kill and destroy. And it seems like a small example, but it's a great example for us to hold on to. It's a great example for us to be reminded that the abundant life that we seek is only in Jesus. It is not in an abundance of time or an abundance of things or in an absence of trouble or challenges or in an absence of busyness. It's purely in Jesus. No matter what the season, no matter what the circumstance, the abundant life that we all desire is in Jesus alone. So, back to resilient faith. Resilient faith, you say, Lord, what does this look like? (laughs) Resilience is never giving up. Resilience is the ability to bounce back. Resilience is pushing through tragedy, crisis, Hardship, it is not allowing loss and hard times to rob us. And in the Word, it says numerous times that we have to have resilient faith. Numerous times. In Philippians 3, 13 to 15, it says, press on. Romans 12, 21 says, overcome hardship and temptation. James 1, 12 encourages us to persevere in the face of trials. And it gives us examples of heroes of our faith. Think of Paul. He was beaten, jailed, stoned for his faith, but he persevered. He had resilient faith, and he saw the promise of God. Think of Job. He lost everything, but he persevered. He never once let his faith waver. Despite his outward circumstances, he held on to God with all of his faith, and he was blessed over and above. And a beautiful theme scripture that we can have for this resilient faith, no matter what our circumstances, is 2 Corinthians 4, 8 to 9. It says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. God never abandons us. God always has a plan. In all of our suffering, in all of our trials, in all of our distress, it's opportunities for Christ to demonstrate his power and his presence. God's power is made perfect in our weakness. God always has a plan. And we know this because he sent Jesus. That was his perfect plan. And Jesus speaks so perfectly and so beautifully about... God's plan. When he started his ministry, you can read it in Matthew 5. It actually starts in Matthew 4. But he started his ministry and he spoke to the people about confessing their sins because the kingdom of heaven was coming. It was here. It was near. It was him. He was the answer. And things were going to change. And he started with his first sermon, which is his, his most famous sermon, Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. But he starts that sermon, and in that sermon, he talks, so please go and read it. I'm not diving into the whole Sermon on the Mount. But go and read it. It speaks into how we are to live in this new kingdom, the characteristics, the values, the ethics that we have living in and through Jesus. But he starts Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes. And if you've ever read the Beatitudes, it's quite daunting. You're just like, wow, Jesus, I do need you. (laughs) But they are eight lines that start with the word blessed. And Jesus spoke into these, and I'm going to read them. You can read them as well. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, 
for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the poor, poor, pure (laughs) in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's Matthew 5, 3 to 12. Um, <laughs> how contrary is that to the way we live, to the, this world? When we experience going through these circumstances, we don't feel blessed. I don't feel blessed. <laughs> blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the poor in spirit. But these attitudes and these the B attitudes are so each B attitude declares a group of people who are usually regarded as afflicted, but are actually blessed. They are actually blessed. And this is not those aren't ways that we need to perform or act to call ourselves Christians. Those are what Jesus says are attributes that he is going to create in us over time through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what we are going to be able to say we can be like because of the power of God, because of the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus who is doing this work in us. How beautiful is that? So contrary to this world. So we don't have to do anything to attain this blessing other than being in the presence of God at his feet, at Jesus' feet. And like I said earlier, I, I'm, when we go through these things, how often do we actually feel like we're blessed? Not often. And one of the enemies of being resilient is this false assumption that when you're in a circumstance, when we are mourning, when we are poor in spirit, when we are being persecuted, that is it. That is forever. The circumstance that I'm experiencing, it feels like forever. You know when you have a new baby and you're like, this is my life forever. <laughs> sleepless nights. <laughs> you know that human nature where we just can't see past our challenges, we can't see past our trials? Is this forever? And this robs us of our resilience. And again, if I go back to Phil's message on mentality monsters, and he spoke into Elijah's wavering faith, it just reminds us that it's been the same all through history. He had such faith in chapter 18, and he saw God literally bring fire down. He prayed, and God answered. He saw miracles in front of him. And you go to chapter 19, and he ran for his life because he was threatened. (laughs) He ran for his life and asked God to take his life. Wavering faith. We can't see past our circumstances. And it robs us of being resilient. And I have my own experience of this being robbed of resilience. Um, when I was pregnant with Jake, who's my oldest son, he's now nine, uh, God encouraged me with Jeremiah 29 verse 11. And I know it's a scripture we've all heard, and I'm sure we'll have it up. You can read it. But it says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future, not disaster. So as a mom, first time mom, we're like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> yes. Jake, (laughs) you have a plan and a purpose. You have a future. God has blessed you. It's going to be amazing, boy. And then I, four weeks before he was due, I went into labor. (laughs) And I was like, what now? (laughs) What's happening? (laughs) But I knew that God said, I have a plan for you. And I had to have an emergency cesarean. And there was a chance that both of us wouldn't make it because of the circumstances. But I held on to Jeremiah 29 verse 11, and I knew God had a plan for Jake, and I was confident. And in the next chapter, nine years later, Jake is now at an age where he has developed an awareness of life, an awareness of death. And he's been faced with numerous circumstances, that are quite tragic circumstances, that have really sparked this awareness of death. And it's actually created in him an anxiety So he is hyper-vigilant of everyone around him. 
when it when it starts when the sun starts to set, he becomes exceptionally anxious. He starts to cry. Now, Jake, if you know Jake, if any of you know Jake, Philly, you know Jake, everyone. He is like a Labrador puppy. <laughs> he bounces off the walls just because he's excited for life. You know, he's just so joyful and he loves people and he loves life and he's never been afraid of anything. I mean, I found him playing his iPad at the age of four in the kitchen, light on by himself, 4 a.m. I was like, what? <laughs> no, this is not okay. Get back to bed. Um, now things have changed. And immediately I had this moment where I couldn't see past this. Jake was going to be in chains of anxiety for the rest of his life. Is this the, like, is this the life that he's going to have? He's going to suffer with anxiety. He's going to, what if it leads into depression? What, is this his life? I was panicked. I've sent him to an anxiety workshop, which is blessing him and giving him the tools for life. But immediately, I lost faith. I forgot that God had said, for I know the plans I have for you, Jake, that to give you a, a, a hope and a future, not disaster. So <laughs> we just forget. <laughs> so let's dive into some practical ways of how we can build this resilient faith into our lives, a, a, a faith that we hold on to, a faith that we don't let go of, a faith that doesn't waver, a faith that perseveres through all things. So my first point is a fixed focus. So we're going to go back to Matthew 5, verse 3. It's the first beatitude that Jesus spoke into. And it says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. That's the NLT version. The NIV says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what does it mean to be poor in spirit? None of us want to admit that we are poor in spirit or want to be poor in spirit. because It doesn't sound very appealing, does it? But it means spiritual poverty. It means being at a place where we are at the feet of Jesus with empty hands. We're at the end of ourselves. We've come to the realization that the expectations on us are too weighty to carry. We come to the realization that we need Jesus. We need his power, his presence. We need him to give us everything that we need. We cannot carry the expectations of this life alone. So we come to his feet empty. And that's poor in spirit. And he says that we are blessed for that. And we come and we bring our sins, we bring our struggles, we bring our sufferings to him. We lay it down at his feet. We repent. And that's when we are blessed because we finally hand over to God. We finally become dependent on God and not self-sufficient, not self-reliant, not independent. And then God can work. Then he's like, welcome. I've been waiting for you. <laughs> Just waiting for you to go through those challenges where you're like, sure, can't do this anymore, God. It says, Jesus says that we are blessed when we're at that place. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. And so another pregnancy story, bear with me. <laughs> this is all about me today, apparently. <laughs> But it's my testimony to Jesus, okay? So just, just go with it. Learn from it. Um, so when I was 14 weeks pregnant with Jude, doctors discovered that I had what they thought was cysts. I was getting this excruciating pain where I was bent over. I couldn't operate. I couldn't do anything. And they then decided that they needed to cut this out because with my uterus growing, this was just going to cause continuous pain. So at 14 weeks, I had to have a procedure called a laparoscopy through my belly button to cut out this cyst. Um, so this posed high risk for my pregnancy, and I was told that I could very well just miscarry because it's so invasive. So this shook us to our core. We are like, okay, Jesus, <laughs> fine. I'm, I'm poor in spirit. I have nothing else. You are fully in control. I have no control over this. So we were poor in spirit, and we came to God. We just laid it at his feet, and we asked all of our family to please pray, just pray. Just pray that this isn't God's plan. And um, and so, if any of you know my father-in-law, Graham, he came over to pray. 
He's so precious at rest. So he came and he was like, we're going to lay hands on your belly. And God has told me, you have to name your baby. You have to name him now and declare life over him. I was like, what? You're crazy. No pressure. But sure, we did that. <laughs> we're like, okay, what's the name? <laughs> so he came over and we named him. I do know his name. I'm just reading it because it's how's me not get emotional. Jude Elijah Evans, which means Yahweh is my God. Awesome, man. So we named him. Graham prayed over my stomach, prayed for us, prayed for the up. We declared life over Jude. And by God's grace alone, the cyst was on a long enough stalk that they could cut it, remove it, and not disturb the pregnancy. Amazing. Hey, God is so good. So I carried full term and gave birth to our beautiful baby boy. God draws near to the poor in spirit. And when we are upheld by his strength and his power, we can be naturally resilient. Being poor in spirit, we are blessed. How are you in need of God's help today? Are you needing to get to the place where you're poor in spirit? So that God can strengthen you and give you everything that you need. On to point number two. <laughs> a pure heart. So now I'm jumping over to Beatitude number six. And it says, God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Who else, when reads that, goes, I'm not going to see God. <laughs> Whoops, I missed the boat on that one. I, I can be, I can do the first one, be poor in spirit, but pure in heart, not so much. <laughs> but pure in heart, the heart is a spiritual heart. It's the center of our life. It's our thoughts, it's our desires, it's our character, it's our will, it's our purpose. And Jesus is not saying he wants perfection because none of us can be perfect. Pure in heart means transparent. It means honest before God. And it's Jesus who then creates this pure in spirit in us. Yeah. It is all thanks to him. Being pure in spirit is impossible. Jesus isn't telling us to purify our hearts. Yeah. That's what he does. Yeah. That's what he does when we're in his presence. That's what he does when we get into his word. That's what he does when we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, lead us, guide us, grow us, lead us. Pure in heart. Psalm 51.10 says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So God is the one who makes us for our, our hearts pure through the sacrifice of his son Jesus and his sanctifying work. And this honesty that Jesus has called us to have, this transparency that he's called us to have, it's difficult. We know none of us want to be honest. We want to be on Instagram looking insta-perfect. <laughs> I don't have worries. I follow Jesus. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> All of us have worries, trials, challenges, difficulties. And... God wants to know what's really in our hearts. He knows, but he wants us to bring it to him. God never asked us to come and try and be perfect before him. He wants to hear what's going on. He wants us to be pure and honest and transparent before him so that he can work in us. So I know it's difficult. It requires vulnerability, but it's a desire of God for us to come to him with our pure hearts and be honest with him and other Christians Hence, life group. Hence, surrounding yourself with a family of faith. We can be pure in heart when we are honest and transparent for God and others. So, what area of your heart are you not being honest and transparent with God with? If you don't know, if you're pretending it's not there, <laughs> allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to you. Because these things can actually block us from experiencing God in his fullness, from him growing us like he wants to into the person he created us to be. So ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what is in your heart that needs to become transparent to God. And my point number three is faith in action. 
Who likes the sound of faith in action? <laughs> Only Justine. The rest of us are like, can I be complacent, please, Jesus? Okay, so Matthew 5, 13 to 16 says this. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Beautiful. Challenging, but beautiful. So Jesus is saying here that we are essential to the world that we're in. It's essential that we are full of flavor, that we are loving Jesus, that we are f have a fixed focus on him with a pure heart before him so that he can do the work in us so that we can go out and shine our light for the rest of the world to see. When we are living out of these this, the presence of Jesus and out of relationship with Jesus, we don't have to work much for others to see him in us. It'll be reflected in the way we do life, in the way we speak, in the words we think. I had to ask myself this question, what am I reflecting to those around me? Because we are not only called to be the light, we're called to be the salt. And we are not only called to bring flavor, but we are called to cause thirst. Salt brings flavor, but it causes thirst. Is your life causing thirst? Are people looking at you going, I want what they've got. I'm, I'm hungry and thirsty for what you have. Like, there's something going on in your life that I want. I don't have that. And I had to check my life going through the season of lukewarm, and go, what are my friends seeing in me? Are they, am I reflecting the love of Jesus, the peace of Jesus, the joy? Or am I just waiting for this holiday? <laughs> or is it just like bubbling out over me? Is it causing others to thirst? It's a question we have to ask ourselves. And it's not a condemning question. It's not a you need to work harder to pretend that you're living in joy. Like I don't see that smile. It's not, it's not a hard of work. It's not work. It's out of relationship with Jesus, like we said. It comes naturally. It flows over from being in his presence, being in the Holy Spirit's presence, being in the word of God that is alive and powerful by living out what Jesus has called us to live by the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to get passionate again, guys. We need to get passionate about the presence of God. You know this amazing experience we have in the presence of God when we come and worship together? No one can deny it, right? It wasn't just me that was like, Jesus is here. The Holy Spirit is here. This you can have in your daily life. We need to seek it. We need to be desperate for the presence of God. And we need to get into the Word of God that is alive. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, sword. Sword, cutting through soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. It is alive and powerful. What is the last promise that you read from Jesus? What is the last testimony you have of his power in your life? We need to get passionate. There's so much that we're missing out on if we're trying to do this life on our own and just persevering through trials and tribulations and challenges and the busyness of life just, just to get to December holidays. That, that's, that's where I'm going to find it all. <laughs> no. Jesus says today, in your hardest moments, you can have a blessed life. James 1.22 says, but don't just listen to the word. You must do what it says. We need to be in God's presence. We need to get into the word, listen to his promises, meditate on them, live by them, apply them into our lives, read, study, meditate, and apply in our lives. This is how the word of God comes alive. So today, can we be challenged enough 
to seek the truth that is in the Word of God. And as you do, be empowered by the Holy Spirit to live out that truth with a desire to live the blessed life that God has for us. Can that be our motivation? No more complacency. That blessed life that God promised us through our challenging times, through our trials, through our challenges, not apart from. So, in conclusion, with resilient faith, we can finish this year strong and flourishing and finish our race strong and flourishing with resilient faith. So we just spoke about three, three practical steps on how to have resilient faith. But with resilient faith, we can finish this year strong, flourishing, and our race. It's human nature for us to want to give up. We saw it with the Israelites. Every chapter, they want to go back to Egypt. Every chapter, you're like, guys, really? <laughs> but that's because we can see the end picture. <laughs> Those poor guys didn't. <laughs> they were just like us. Daniel was in the lion's den. And I spoke about someone else here. <laughs> Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery. Those are challenging times that they held on, they persevered in their faith. They had resilient faith and they saw the promises of God. God always has a plan. And He always provides for what we need. He says in John 15, 45, Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot produce fruit unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. How do you like that last line? For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. In this analogy, we see that we need Jesus as much as a branch needs to be connected to a vine. In order to flourish and have resilient faith, we have to be connected to Jesus all the time. Thank you, Jesus, that we have a way. God made a way. So again, like I said, this is so many of my testimonies. Coming back to my story about my pregnancy with Jude, that wasn't it, <laughs> believe it or not. The whole year was challenging. Ask Derek, <laughs> his favorite year of his life. <laughs> he was busy writing his finals. He's a specialist. He's an emergency specialist at Curtis Gear, and he was busy writing his finals for his exams this week that I had to have this cyst cut out. So that was highly stressful. Then they sent it away. And it came back that it wasn't a cyst. It was, in fact, cancer. And they would need to take rid of my left ovary when I gave birth to Jude. So I go in to give birth to Jude. And excuse the graphics, but they open up and they see, oh, there's another tumor on your right ovary. So everything needs to come out. You have to have a full hysterectomy on this table right now. So welcome your baby boy and then say goodbye to the rest. <laughs> and that was heart-wrenching. Whew, that was heart-wrenching. I had this idea of three. I'm from three, Derek's from three. It was this dream we had. But it wasn't God's plan. So we had to like mourn this third child. This sounds crazy, but moms, you feel me. <laughs> At, we had to like mourn this third child that we weren't going to be able to have. It was hard. Then 10 weeks later, on Christmas Eve, Jude gets diagnosed with meningitis. 10 weeks old. This is Derek's, like, he's a doctor. It's his worst nightmare because he knows what can happen. But they treated him for bacterial meningitis, which means that he was at risk of brain damage, being deaf, being blind. But by God's grace, it wasn't. It was just the other meningitis, which I don't have the name for right now. <laughs> so we spent our first Christmas in hospital with Jude while my three-year-old spent that Christmas with his grandparents without us. So this is hard. It, it shook us. It made us question God. Like, where are you? This is so hard. Why would you allow this? Why would you allow us to go through this? And it shook Derek for a long time. We were angry. We were confused. But by the grace of God, 
Judah's perfectly healthy. He's a feisty little seven-year-old who's going to tackle the world. Nothing's going to hold him back. He tells me, I love Jesus more than you, Mom. I'm like, fantastic. But we chose to hold on. We chose to persevere. We chose to be resilient in our faith. And God came through. He came through. And through our perseverance, we were made stronger. We grew in character and we grew in our faith. So I want to encourage you, don't let challenges cause you to run from God. Let them cause you to run to God. Romans 5 verse 3 to 5 says, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop, develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill us with His love. I want to say this at the end of the day. This is what Paul said to himself in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 to 8. I have found, I have, <laughs> is it going to come up? There we go. Okay, let me start that again because I messed that up. I have fought the good fight and I have finished the race and I've remained faithful. <laughs> and now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Church, the blessed life we desire is a result of resilient faith. And resilient faith requires a surrendered heart and perseverance. Can I encourage us all to stand? I want to pray for all of us. First, I want to pray for all of us who feel like they need resilient faith. They don't have it. They want it. They need that perseverance. Those who are going through trials and struggles and challenges and they want God to bring them through stronger and then we're going to pray for those who don't know this Jesus that I've spoken about that I've given testimonies about so can we pray if this is if if you are in that space where you're going through challenges and you feel it's not your faith and you want your faith to be resilient I want to just encourage you to surrender your heart to God at this time Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the places in your heart that you need to be honest and transparent with and surrender. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for who you are and that with you we can do all things. Lord Jesus, I pray for everyone here today. I just pray for your blessing over them, Lord. I pray that you'll give them such a revelation of who you are just a reminder in their hearts that you are always with us, that you never leave us nor forsake us. You promise that we can do all things through you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll reveal to us the places in our hearts that are not surrendered to you, that you don't have access to, that we aren't honest and transparent with. Lord, I pray that you'll give all of us resilient faith so that we can all say that I have run this race and been resilient in my faith. I've held on to my faith and got to the end of my race. Thanks to you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I pray for those who don't know you. If you don't know Jesus, I want to give you the opportunity to give your heart to him today. And so maybe as a church, we can all pray together. Lord, thank you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you, Father God, that you love me unconditionally and that you made a way for me to be in relationship with you and to live with you forever in eternity. Lord, I give you my heart. I want to be honest and transparent before you, Lord. I pray for your forgiveness of my sins. I surrender my life to you. I pray that you'll walk with me and guide me every day of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 
Hey, wasn't that such an encouraging message? Thank you so much, Roxy, uh, for that. We hope that it has found you where you are today and has uplifted you and led you closer to Jesus. Uh, just before we close, as we have come to the end of our service, I really do just want to encourage you uh, to not leave today without swinging by um, our website, finding out a little bit more about us. And we really do want to encourage you, if you'd love to find out more about our church, connect to our church, or even just reach out to us. Maybe you need some prayer, um, or maybe God is doing something awesome in your life. You'd love to share that with us as a church. Please head over to our website, which is www.revivechurch.ca. Fill in a connection card, or even just work through our website, and you can find out anything that you might need to know or would like to know about our church. Well, hey, I hope that you have an amazing rest of your day. God bless you. Have a fantastic week and we'll see you soon. Cheers.